Hello everyone, welcome to the Yoga Escapes in Japan podcast series. My name is Amy McCartney. Yoga Escapes in Japan is a two-year project funded by the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science and is hosted by the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies at Kyoto University, Japan. The aim of this project is to understand and document the popularity and consumption of global yoga within the Japanese cultural setting. In January, we attended the Chala Conference in Siem Reap, Cambodia, where Dr. Patrick McCartney presented his paper on Representing the Revival of Sanskrit, the Political Theology of Speaking in a Post-Vernacular Mother Tongue. Thanks, Aru. I will begin. Um, so, what, I've, what I'm going to talk about today is basically a, a, a secondary project that I've been working on in a self-funded way for around about a decade, I suppose now. Uh, I got interested in spoken Sanskrit and then uh, people who speak Sanskrit and then in, started looking at code switching between Hindi and Sanskrit and then started... There's a lot of rumors or factoids about Sanskrit. Uh, the, you know, if, if you go to India, or you meet people on the street corner, they'll, they'll, a, lot, a lot of times people will say to you, oh, you know, there's a village in India where everyone speaks Sanskrit. And that was kind of the catalyst for, for this, this, this project, which I call Imagining uh, Sanskrit Land. So I've got a few articles I've written. Here's, uh, here they are. I've also made uh, and are in the process of making a a short film series about this one village I spent some time in in 2015, uh, which is this one, uh, Jiri. So it's a Madhya Pradesh, and I'll talk a bit about that today as well. So I think it's important to start with when we talk about Sanskrit speakers, and especially when we think about what's in the Indian census in terms of the results that are returned. Um, it doesn't say Sanskrit speakers in the census. What it does say is persons who return Sanskrit as their mother tongue or whatever language. Uh, so this is an important point to make, is that just because it says that there are 24,821 speakers of Sanskrit, but that's probably not the case. Uh, so the, the results are unreliable for lots of reasons because there are quite a few uh, Hindu nationalist groups that actively promote people saying that Sanskrit is their spoken lang first language or, or second or third language. So when maybe they just can say Om or maybe they can recite some prayer in Sanskrit or maybe they think that because their language that they speak is related to Sanskrit then, you know, so it's not like this in some ways, you know, people are being dishonest. It's just this a different way of kind of rationalizing things. So here's a, a little trailer for episode five. Check from the top. Boy, she chala ti ba. Stop. Photo chala. Chala do. Chala ma. Ek gider bhi le. Kinchi kinchi tatra bahut. Taadi ti aisha taadi ti. Hey mar. Mar ti hai bhai. Aane. Maisa. Namon ma. Bahun matta asti sa. Asti. Chala do dani. In my primary job, my, the research I'm doing at the moment at Kyoto University is I'm looking at the global wellness industry and wellness tourism and spiritual tourism. Um, and so, you know, yoga and Sanskrit are two sides to a kind of Indian soft power coin in a sense. So the, both of these projects kind of like interweave in, in many ways. And so in a kind of very neo-romantic type of way, uh, the use of this kind of uh, neo-orientalist imagination of, of the way in which yoga and Sanskrit can help you to more or less become type, some type of ubermensch, um, you know, through gaining uh, yoga powers or becoming a super yogi. Uh, so Sanskrit is, is quite a central component to that. So you'll find, you know, this is just from some random yoga website that has a section on Sanskrit to kind of increase its symbolic capital in some way. And you know, you, you find all these, these assertions that Sanskrit's, you know, the oldest language known to man and all, it's the, it's the, 
the horse brak of, uh, of all the languages in the world, and even NASA uses Sanskrit to program its satellites. And, I mean, there are, there, are, there are many types of factoids which, which just, in an unbiological way, keep getting repeated. So, um, so it's all quite interesting to pass these, these rumours. And that the Sanskrit villages are, are part of this rumour as well. Um, even amongst in the academy, you have you know, Sanskritists who, who 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 believe in this type of myth, and then you have Sanskritists who think it's utter nonsense. So, uh, so part of me has been wanting to be, put it into proper perspective. You could say, actually go to these villages and, and spend time there and find out what's going on. So, this this is a roadmap from Sanskrit Parati, which is the basically one of the the main groups that promotes a, a revitalized Sanskrit. Uh, and so integral, this is the integral humanism, which is um, basically like a, an eco-theology. And the whole point is a renaissance. And coming along this timeline, so you have Sanskritam Saralam, Sanskritam Sarvesham, so speaking simple Sanskrit all the time, and then Sanskritam Anir Gadyam, which kind of means like Building up a critical mass, and then at the end it's uh, Sanskritam Sarvatra, so Sanskrit everywhere. So Sanskrit becomes a, a quite a central component of of creating this Abhidhaya, which is uh, more or less a euphemism in some ways for creating a Hindu nation and also a Hindu world. Uh, so that's that's the that's the goals actually. To, in some ways, to create a Hindu nationalist pan global kind of caliphate, you know, give it, put it in some context. Um, I'm not being hyperbolic, I mean, of people saying all this stuff, that's their, their aims, including this guy. Parivartanam na agachati Tattvanam jivane acharane na parivartanam agachati Mahan vicharaha sti te karane na janaha na svikurvanti vichara se prushtataha shakti hi apikshita shakti mina vichara se manyata nibhavati tarihi samuskurta siya tatuanam acharane na apicha tesham vicharanam pracharaya shakti nirmane na Kevalam vayam agre guntum shaknamaha Tadartham asmakam mama nivedanam yatu vayam sarve militwa Samuskurta bhasha madhyamena Punaha adhyanam kurmaha Ekameva amsham vadami Bhagavad Gita yaha bhasha Samuskurtam परंतु जना हां समस्कृतम न जानंती इति अनुवादम पठितवन्तः समस्कृतम ना जना हां अध्यापि गीताम न पठन्ति गीतायाः अनुवादम पठन्ति कारणम गीतायाः भाषाम न जानन्ति योगः आवश्यकः सर्वेपि योगस्य अनुसरणम कर्तुम प्रयत्नम कुर्वन्ति परंतु योगस्य भाषा मास्तु वेदांतम आवश्यकम अन्य भाषायाम वेदांतम पठन्ति समस्कृतम न आवश्यकम आयुर्वेदस्य भाषा समस्कृतम ज्योतिषस्य भाषा समस्कृतम प्राचीन भारतीय गणितस्य भाषा समस्कृतम भरतनाट्यस्य भरतमुनेः नाट्यशास्त्रस्य भाषा समस्कृतम जीवन से यत्किम भी क्षेत्रम स्वीकरो तो तस्य क्षेत्र से भाषा संस्कृत भाषा आस्ति तर ही अस्मा भी ही पुनरपि योग माध्यम में ना संस्कृत माध्यम में ना योग हा पठनीय हा संस्कृत माध्यम में ना वेदांतम पठनीयम संस्कृत माध्यम में ना नाट्यशास्त्रम पठनीयम संस्कृत माध्यम में ना आर्थशास्त्रम पठनीयम संस्कृत माध्यम मूल ज्ञानम संस्कृत माध्यम में न प्राप्त महा तदर्थम वयम संस्कृतम पठा महा संस्कृतम पठित्वा एतान ग्रंथान सर्वान पठा महा तरही पुनरपि 
एषा भारतीय ज्ञान परंपरा अमेरिका देशे अपि सार्वत्रिक रूपेण जनै ही स्वीकृता भवेत इदानीम विश्वे यानि परिवर्तनानि जायमानानि संति एतत आधारेण एकम विचारम वदामि किमर्थम संस्कृतम इति यदि भवताम बालाह पृच्छन्ति चेत बाय 2050 विश्वस्य धर्मः हिंदू धर्मः भवति यह धर्मः संस्कृत भाषया प्रतिपादितः धर्मशासित समाज व्यवस्था पुनः विश्वे सर्वत्र धर्म सिविलाइजेशन पुनः आगच्छति विश्वे सर्वे ही स्वीकृता भवति तस्य दिनस्य कृते सज्जतायम सज्जतायह आरंभम करोत 2025 अनंतरम तस्य आरंभ हबवती नवा कालखंड तस्य आरंभ हबविष्यती यत्र समस्कृत प्रतिपादित भारतीय ज्ञान परंपरा यह पुनरुत्थान तस्य प्रारंभ हबवती तस्मिन काले यस्य आधुनिक ज्ञानम प्राचीन ज्ञानम द्वयो हो संगमा अस्ति सह नेत्रत्वम स्वीकरोति समाज जीवनस्य राष्ट्र जीवनस्य विश्वस्य समस्कृत भारती यूएसए इत्यस्य लक्ष्यम किम इति पृच्छति चेत so right here's a map I have uh, of some of the villages I've been to this one up on along the Brahmaputra and Tezpur and Assam uh, it's, and I've been to this one in Chile and this is where I did my PhD field work in a, in a yoga ashram that's also a Mahavidyalaya or a Sanskrit college uh, so there's a bunch more I'd really like to get up to Uttarakhand in Chamoli district there's one or a couple of villages up there but the one thing I'll talk about where I've been focusing a bit more time recently is around here in Uttar Pradesh and I'll, I'll show you why but I'll talk a little bit about Jiri in the remaining 11 minutes um, so I, I spent about a month here uh, in 2015, there's no running water, there's no electricity. All I got to eat was raw onion and a stack of royalty twice a day. And I slept on the roof of the barn and I showered with the buffalo. Um, it was, and I went to a lot of weddings. Yeah, and I almost got thrown into a well by some people that thought that because I ate cow, I shouldn't be allowed to live. Um, Interesting. It's really interesting. Welcome back. There is a unique village in Rajgarh district of Madhya Pradesh where almost all the people always converse in Sanskrit. Children here are determined to teach Sanskrit to people who they meet. Villagers initially resisted the language, but now after three years, they simply can't do without it. So, yeah, according to the Indian census, there's 976 people, which is more than what I, I did a census of the 92 dwellings. Um, so, yeah. But the Indian media um, has this to say about Jiri. A lost world rediscovered Jiri is India's own Jurassic Park that has been recreated carefully and painstakingly that lives a precarious existence, cut off from the compelling realities of the world outside. Ten years have been enough for the Sanskritization of life here. So many of you know of uh, Srinivas's uh, theory on Sanskritization, where people adopt the markers, the uh, the behaviors, the lifestyles of higher status groups. So that's what they're talking about. But in some ways, this has been imposed, or there's been a kind of coercion that's occurred. For the residents of this village, Sanskrit is not only a language, but also a medium to become more cultured and civilized. And this has helped them to a large extent in achieving the goals of social harmony, development, and prohibition. So they're a Sondhya Jati, so they're Kshatriya uh, Varna. Uh, so, you know, according to the caste rules, they can drink alcohol and eat meat, but they've kind of chosen not to do that, at least publicly. I saw people, you know, drinking. And I smoked a few chillums with like 93 year old men with, you know, pink turbans and their glasses turned off to the falling off their heads. It was a, all quite an interesting thing. Um, but this idea of development is something that I've 
my postdoc application I've been submitting to many places is all about looking at the ways in which yoga, not a central fulcrum, but it's an integral part of the United Nations Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and the Indian government is uh, basically pushing that if everyone just did yoga and spoke Sanskrit, then you know all of the, the world's problems would more or less just disappear. So uh, it's, it's very much part of a soft power type of thing. Anyway, in this village, the, ma the main language that's spoken is is a dialect of Malvi, it's called Mavadi Malvi, then Hindi and then Sanskrit. There were more people speaking Sanskrit. Um, but this, so when you go outside this kind of, this area, uh, and you, you know, you ask people, you know, do you speak Malvi? And they're like, you know, Joketi Bashi, and Karabe, this is a farmer's uh, language, I don't speak that, you know. So in some ways, the, this, this village is trying very hard to uh, improve their, their status. And so, this is basically what I came up with. I, I came across the 107 people that spoke in this Samyakuru Pan. Amongst some Sanskrit speakers, this is a kind of thing. They want to speak Samyakuru Pan with good form as opposed to Asamyakuru Pan. So, um, gives you an idea. But even though I had people that are going, oh, isn't it great that everyone in the village speaks Sanskrit? You know, you turn to the person next to them and you know, start trying to have a conversation and their eyes get wide and looking for prompts and, you know, can barely even like put a, a really basic sentence together. So people's ideas about what it means to speak Sanskrit are quite varied. Um, but here's one example from a text in WhatsApp. So, Kutra Kolani Magachitiva, and it basically means where are you coming to in the colony? So you can see how this English word has basically had the marker of a the object added to it, so it's kind of been sanskritized. Um, I don't want to talk too much about that. This is another example from inside a house. So Bhavanta Agachantus is third person uh, imperative, uh, saying, you know, please come. And but then Swagatam Asti. So this is interesting, I think, because basically this, as far as I can kind of understand it, this is more or less like someone thinking in Hindi and writing a Sanskrit sentence. So, because in, in Sanskrit you don't have to use the auxiliary verb. It's, it's not obligatory to have it in a sentence. So, so what's going on there? So, um, Alright, so I've spent the last couple of months looking at the Indian census. Much time I've spent like six months. Uh, and one of the, the main forms is C17 and C16. And some of these uh, forms are quite big, they have like 25,000 entries. Um, so it's all been a bit time stamped. So here's one of them, and it shows the over the years. Uh, the rise and fall of people who have reported Sanskrit as their first language. So 1991, you know, like what, what happened there? Uh, it's basically when the Indian economy opened up. And so now apparently there's 24,821 speakers. Um, in terms of looking at the states, so Maharashtra supposedly has 3,802, as opposed to only 400 10 years ago. And Bihar has also, you know, had a huge increase. But Uttar Pradesh has halved. I, I have no idea, like, you know, what's going on there. And then Rajasthan has, um, has more than doubled. Madhya Pradesh has grown much more. And Karnataka has grown only a little bit. So uh, it's quite, quite interesting to tease this stuff apart. So then if you start looking at Okay, if Hindi, if Hindi is the first language of people, uh, and what is the second language, and then Sanskrit is the third language, you, you end up with a list like this. English, so Hindi is the first, and English is the second language. And so then, these are the numbers. So if someone speaks Hindi and then Urdu, there's only 4,000 people. And in Italy, only 2,300 people spoke Sanskrit. And all that. So, so there's this curious connection between being a Hindi speaker and then speaking uh, English. Um, 
And so here are these, these numbers basically according to the 2011 census. So this, this data only came out in the second half of last year. It took them seven years to release the language data. Um, so 422 million speak Hindi and their second language, 323 million have English and then three and a half million people have Sanskrit as their third language. Um, and if you just look at the Sanskrit totals, 24 million pe people speak Sanskrit and 1.2 million have san recorded Sanskrit as the second language and 4 million as the third language. I'll just talk quickly in the last few minutes about Uttar Pradesh. Um, so going through, through the data, um, looking at the towns, so every, this, so this is the table C16, uh, and then it's a state code, and then a district code, and a town code. So for some reason, Kanapur has the highest number of people, but you would think that some place like Varanasi, which is you know a home, a very famous place for Hinduism and some Portland Sanskrit University, you would think that there would be more than more people speaking Sanskrit there, but uh, there's not. Um, and I don't actually know like this municipal corporation why it's recorded twice. This is something that I honestly no one's been able to kind of uh, tell me about. So yeah, this is the kind of close up some statistics, so I, I don't know why this, halved, this number is halved in, in 10 years. Um, but then you can also take it down to a rural versus urban, and the distinction is that a town has to have more than 5,000 people to be considered an urban centre. So there are more people in the urban areas than the rural areas in Uttar Pradesh, supposedly speaking Sanskrit. And here are some other towns. So Lucknow has dropped considerably. Unnao has dropped considerably, and so has Gorakhpur. So it's interesting to me. I mean, this, this rise in the kind of BJP and Hindu nationalism. I would have thought that a state like uh, Uttar Pradesh would have been uh, having more sense. But so here's Sitapur district. This is one place I would really like to go. I would like to try and get some funding. I would like some people to come and we could like, you know, work on this together maybe. Um, it's a bit kind of hard to do it by, by oneself. So Sitapur district, this is not, there's six. So in, at an administrative level, you have the nation, you have the states, then you have the districts, and there's a sub-district administrative level called the TESL. And so these are the, the tests. So within Sitapur district, there is a tessel called Sitapur. And so it has the highest number of speakers. And yeah, there's, so there's been a considerable increase in Sitapur district for some reason. Um, so this is what the map looks like of Sitapur. So this is Sitapur tessel within Sitapur district. And so this is the total number of recorded speakers. And then these are the gender splits. So it's 378 males and 344 females. So you go over to Lahapur and you know the numbers are quite different. So um, yeah, so coming back to my map, so Sitapur district is around here, basically. Uh, so that's that's pretty much it. I want to go and, and do more work on this. One reason I've been looking at the census results is to try and figure out where I should go. Uh, whether people speak Sanskrit or not, I think is in some ways irrelevant because it's more about this, you know, imagined uh, social world. Uh, it's about myth making and nation building, and so it's in some ways, you know, people will say to me, "Oh, you know, why are you going to these villages? No one speaks Sanskrit, right?" It's like, well, I mean, the people are there and they have these dreams, and it's be interesting to talk to them nonetheless and, and to put it into perspective. So, uh, this is my website. And if you want to uh, get in contact with me, that would be that would be nice to hear from you. So I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have a discussion and comment. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> um, 
wondering what the role caste plays. In, I mean, it seems that the sensitization process is happening with all the imagination and the, the possibility to purify ritually uh, some of the community. So is caste a, a very important uh, category? So, do I turn that off? Oh. Um, so the RSS is the Rastriya Swayam Sarek Sang, and they're, they're basically one of the, they're a nationalist, a volunteer corps is what it translates to. Um, they supposedly consider that caste is something that should be abolished, but then at the same time it's, they are quite keen to kind of keep this brahminical hegemony. Uh, around because uh, it works for some people. Uh, if you go and attend the Sanskrit Bharati Sanskrit uh, camps, you can do these two week intensive camps where they literally lock you in a compound, take your passport, don't allow you to leave, and they hit you if you don't speak Sanskrit. Um, or they lock you in a room for 24 hours without food and water and don't let you leave. Um, and then ask you, you know, do you still want to leave? Yeah. Damn right, I want to leave. No, this happened to someone I know. Actually, it didn't happen to me. Uh, you know, caste is, of course, caste is a really important issue in India, and it's it's quite quite a curious thing. So, one example is that this one village up in Chamoli district in Uttarakhand, so way up in the Himalayas near Tibet, Nepal border. There's a there's a report of this one village. And it says that basically the women in the next village who aren't Brahmin uh, are jealous of the women who have learned to speak Sanskrit in this village because they don't have split ends in their hair. And their hair is more lustrous. and they, You know, I mean, it gets down to this really kind of like funky level of... Uh, like, uh, so, yeah, I mean, we could, we could spend a couple of lifetimes talking about issues of caste, but in short, I mean, yeah, it's a very important issue. So. Which I think a lot about. Um, thanks for the talk, it's really fascinating stuff. But my question is that when you have all this investment in Sanskrit as this language of purity and, and power and the vehicle that is going to return Dharmic civilization not just to the community but also to the earth and so on and so on, that, that often when you have these kind of uh, intense ideological pressures associated with the language that that are very positive. The inverse of that is that there's also intense shame associated with, uh, you know, uh, the people's capacity to speak the language. So I'm just wondering, in the communities that you observe, what are people's, you know, ideological positions and emotional relationships with with the language and their use of it, and how are they related to those broader sort of hyper-valorizations of the language. Yeah, um, so in, in Jiri, I, I, I was under the assumption that the, the Sanskrit Bharati and the RSS went there and said to everyone, you, you guys are going to speak Sanskrit, because we need you to speak Sanskrit. You know, so in this whole like, language nest thing, there's some, some idea that if you can find a monolingual community, is, there's some merit in finding a, you know, this hermetically sealed type of village, and it plays into the, all this myth making about um, the purity of the Indian village as well in the, in the Indian imagination. Uh, but in in Chile, for example, I mean, you had some people who were really gung ho about speaking Sanskrit, um, and then you had other people who couldn't care less. I mean, they had no interest in it, but they were coerced by the village elders to attend the morning classes. So, some, so they apparently asked Sanskrit Bharati to bring in, uh, initially it was one teacher, a Christian woman from Chhattisgarh who speaks like fluent Sanskrit. She came to the village six months later, a Brahmin pundit, Acharya Tiwari, his name, is also from Eastern Madhya Pradesh, and to, to teach the men. And then they got married. So this Brahmin man has married a Christian woman. And now they've got two kids. They live in the village, but they don't teach Sanskrit. And I could 
not get to the bottom of it. I mean, I was only going to go there for a couple of days and then go to another village in Banswado, in like southern Rajasthan, which is all Adivasis, all um, uh, like out of caste tribals, basically. And but then, you know, the longer I stayed, it was like became more and more interesting. Um, yeah, so they they, they don't they don't. Uh, they don't teach Sanskrit anymore. And they actually, the villagers actually asked me to ask Acharya Tiwari and his wife if they would speak, uh, start teaching them again. But there was some, there was this weird charge of like corruption. People wanted more money and all this stuff. So it's, it's really complicated, like even down to the, like this grassroots level. Um, but, but then on the flip side of it, the whole ideology thing is that Sanskrit, in, in many ways, for a lot of people, it's, it's been co-opted by Hindu nationalists. And there is a kind of shame involved in the sense that it basically, and it's not the case all the time, I, I want to be clear about that, that people who are interested in Sanskrit and promote Sanskrit and want to speak it, it's not a one-to-one -one that they're always going to be just some like fundamentalist, rabbit nationalist type of thing, right? But that's a common perception. If you're into Sanskrit, then you I mean, I get it myself. I've had people that have met me, or before they've met me, and they go, oh, Patrick, you're nothing like what I thought. I thought you'd be like this wannabe Brahmin, and you know, you'd be boring, and you're just like, you were some like, like white Hindu to a Hindu nationalist kind of thing. Because I, you know, I work on yoga and Sanskrit, so these perceptions are kind of interesting, right? So, Uh, Sanskrit is an Indian language. Indian existed as a diglossia from the time of antiquity. And Sanskrit is a other written language. And they are spoke, spoken from us practice. So if we talk about Sanskrit, it means it's, it is a uh, form of language which is written. So what your service says that the vernacular of Sanskrit, or spoken form of Sanskrit, uh, spoken in the uh, India, different part of India, uh, 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 following the same written form of uh, Sanskrit in their speaking uh, in the daily uh, daily to daily in, in the daily life, in daily uh, that is in spoken in, in speech in speech they use the written form or they created a uh, speech variety. And if, if they are they are they say similar all over the India? Oh uh, no, I mean it's different. You can go back and look at some older texts um, that that are looking at dialectical variations back you know a couple of thousand years ago before it entered a post vernacular state, and there was language shift uh, and these things. Um, and today. Now, I mean, this is one thing I, I'm curious about, is how people speak it, you know, the, the substrate interference that, that comes from, you know, their first language. Um, but there's an interesting... Basically, in this village, I mean, people were speaking more or less some type of, like, Hindi that, that was just using Sanskrit words. Basically, I think that grammatically they're, they're really just speaking Hindi. Um, so I'd be curious. I mean, like I said, I, I, I haven't... This has all been quite self-funded and quite piecemeal, so there are many things I would like to look at, and this would be one of them, is, is spending a lot more time in different communities between the south and the north and looking at uh, how people do speak Sanskrit differently. But of course, I mean, you can say that, that, that there is there is some going to be some difference. So. Okay, one last question. Yeah, just a comment on this uh, that uh, you have to distinguish between this new undertaking, which is a kind of uh, attempt to revive Sanskrit uh, funded by the uh, right wing, and traditional modes of Sanskrit speaking. They are very different from area to area in certain preferences, and these reflected uh, regional languages. So in, in Northern Sanskrit would be different 
on certain zones to the first things. What has happened in this particular type of uh, land which has been now being promoted is it originated in the Tirupati area, such as the Yavit. And there it was influenced by southern uh, languages, which included the post question particle ba, which functions very similar as in the Vidi languages where you end the question with ba, and you use ba in the same sense. And uh, that's being now promoted uh, across India. So in that sense, there is a leveling, uh, and this is the idea, presumably, of creating a single standard uh, to be used by everybody who wants to use Sanskrit now. Mm -hmm. Traditional Sanskritists tend to be opposed to that, even now. Okay. Uh, we will go to the next presenter. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>